Hi everybody, Krista Cowan here with uh, the second in our series behind the scenes at Ancestry.com. With me today is Senior Product Manager Laren Brown. Hi, Laren, how you doing? Hi, good. Good. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Why don't we start with how you got started in family history? Well, it's a little interesting because I wasn't terribly interested in family history as a child. Uh, my family was. And so whenever my mom or my grandmother would do family history, I'd run and hide, <laughs> go in the woods, do whatever I could, because I knew I had a full hour of unsupervised <laughs> adult um, attention. But l later in life, I started helping my grandmother put together her history. Mm -hmm. And I just became just entranced with all of the stories yeah. and the pictures. Yeah. Okay. How long have you been at Ancestry.com? Uh, since the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so almost 13 years. Wow, one of the few. <laughs> okay. And tell us a little bit about some of the roles you've had over those 13 years. Well, I've had uh, a really interesting chance to do a lot of things at Ancestry. Um, started as a product manager, and that's what I do now. But in the middle, I worked a little bit on the acquisition side of the content, where the content comes from, scanning the content. Um, and got to spend some time in England and Europe doing some really interesting scanning jobs and acquiring content out of very interesting places, basements, archives, that sort of thing. <laughs> that's great. So now you're working on um, a really exciting project, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, there's some, some words and some phrases that are, might get tossed around, and so let's just make sure everybody understands what we're talking about. Um, the official title of today's presentation is about data extraction, and specifically you've been working on the U.S. city directories. That's right. Um, so uh, do you want to just jump right into your presentation and, and maybe use that to explain some of these terms? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. There's, there's several ways that um, content can be acquired. And one of the ways that we do this is from handwritten documents. Somebody has to type it all in. Another way that it can be done is from material that's sourced from printed books. There's a technology called OCR. You may have heard of it. It's actually fairly common, been around for a few years. But it stands for Optical Character Recognition. What that means is there's a software program that's coupled with a scanner. And when that scanner scans an image, the software program understands how to read the letters, the numbers, the characters off of that book, translates them into text so that they can be uh, searched. So we've been, we've been doing this at Ancestry for some time with kind of mixed results. Uh, it, it produces searchable content, but not really usable content, content that you can attach right to your tree. So one of the things that the team that I work on has been doing over the last year is taking OCR source material and structuring it, turning it into something that's a little more useful and a little more like what you would see from a handwritten source material. Okay. So what we've done is we took a collection of content that has been on Ancestry since 2008. It's the U.S. City Directory's collection and we made a new, another copy of that and started experimenting with how could we make this better? How do we make it more useful and more usable for, for those trying to do their history? We also added some new content to this collection. <laughs> so we doubled the number doubled of pages it, yeah. um, and by bringing in some additional sources that we've had uh, kind of on tap. And then what we've done is um, that expands the scope. So if we go ahead, it expands the scope of what we really have available on Ancestry. So given a sense of how many names are in this collection, um, to, it's now 10% of all the records on Ancestry wow. are in this collection. Um, it's 26,000 books, and that's a, that's a hard number to get your head around. The best way to think about it is if you stack them all on top of each other, all those books, four times higher than the Empire State <laughs> Building, which is a big pile of books yeah. that we went through. So when you do just straight OCR, you get what you see on the screen there on the left where it's just a big bag of words. Um, it's just how the, the OCR software recognizes what we're doing. So the computer just reads a word at a time. A letter it doesn't at a time. Know what yeah, those a letter are. at a time. It doesn't okay. even know what words are. Okay. And so often if there's a little bit of noise on the page or dirt or, or the printing's poor, you get all sorts of interesting and unhelpful characters. <laughs> look like swear words that are being edited out. And also it just doesn't really help us when we're trying to do our family history because you can't attach anything from this from this uh, page to your tree. You have to right. kind of almost type it over again. Okay. So that was then, and this is now, Now right? we have fields. So it, it'll look and feel just like a regular database on Ancestry that was, was keyed by, um, from like a handwritten source material would have. So we're going to have names. We're going to have uh, residence information, the date of where they lived and when and, and, and place. 
Uh, something quite interesting, we've done our best. It's, it's uh, a little bit sketchy here and there, but we've got street address. So if you know that they live on 12 Maple Street in Philadelphia, we can narrow that search down quite a bit. Well, Another really interesting thing is we're building families out of these records. So if a spouse is listed, we create a little mini family. So when you attach that record, both of them come over and you now have two people in your tree. Finally, um, occupation is something that uh, often is quite interesting to learn about people, and it changes over time, mm -hmm. sometimes year by year. So as you go through the city directories, you get to see more about the history, kind of backstory of the family as they went from being a carpenter to a policeman. Yeah. Um, but it also sometimes helps us differentiate between people of the same name. Yeah. yeah that's one of those great yeah. things about occupation. <laughs> I've, I've come from a long line of John Browns, so that <laughs> is really important to me. One thing I'll note while we're talking about occupation is they do use a lot of uh, abbreviations. So you kind of bone up on your abbreviations for occupation. Like we had a problem with uh, clerk. Mm -hmm. Lots of clerks out there, and they would come in CLK. Yeah. But sometimes the OCR, again, is just trying to figure out what those characters are, and it would say, I don't think that's a word, <laughs> but elk. Now that's a word. So we had lots of people with the occupation of, of elk. elk. That's great. So we had to fix that. But you have to watch those, those abbreviations. Okay. And then the final piece in the fielding? Yeah. So death date is a really interesting thing that I didn't really know was in the collection when we started. But basically as the... The people publishing these books would canvass the neighborhood every year. They'd knock on the door and say, who lives here? Almost like a census. And they would say, we have on, the, the canvasser would say, on our record, we have Samuel Johnson living here. And the person answering the door would say, oh, no, I'm sorry, he died. Mm. Can you tell me when he died? Yes, I can. It was the 12th of April. They would write that down, yeah. and that shows up in the record. Um, and so there, this is one of the uh, alternate ways to yeah. find out when somebody died. Absolutely. That's terrific. Okay. So another a note on the scale. When we're trying to merge something into trees, it's often quite uh, handy to have everything just come over really smooth and really clean and you don't have to type anything <laughs> in. That was not the case before. Today, we now have a billion records that have been extracted and all of those will merge neatly into your tree. We love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, corrections are really important because this is still from OCR source material, so there are errors. It's not like someone went and typed all these in. So if there, you do find your ancestor with, a, with an error, before there was nothing you could do but just kind of grit your teeth and say, I wish I could fix that. <laughs> Today, you can go ahead and just go down in the bottom panel in the image viewer, type in the name as you know it, make that correction, and uh, help everyone else downstream from you who comes to that record later find your ancestor. That's great. And even though we've just launched, we've, we have nearly 100,000 corrections entered already. Wow, that's fantastic. Okay, so here's how it works. At the beginning of the, the process, we take an image that you see there on the left of the screen, which is just a scan of a city directory page. We then run the OCR on it, which has been um, done in the past, but we have upgraded our OCR engine, so it's better than it was. <laughs> but it does still create this kind of bag of words approach. Okay. Then we run some patented algorithms that we've been working on very uh, hard for the last year to extract what are names and dates and places, and then do some inference on gender and residence and uh, marriage years from this information that we found on the record. And what I've highlighted here in yellow are all the things you couldn't find before using just the OCR wow. searching. That's impressive. The main reason you couldn't is, if, if you can see on the page, it's a little bit hard to see, but often what they do is they don't write the surname for each person. Okay. They just put a little ditto mark. Mm -hmm. Say, so it starts at brown and then ditto, 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 all the way down the page. Right. Well, those dittos weren't, of course, didn't mean anything to the old system. They were just little dots. Mm -hmm. So now, and, and so those names weren't really searchable. You couldn't find, um, you know, Samuel Johnson because Johnson didn't appear as a surname. Right. We've done uh, a very comprehensive pass through this, and it sometimes goes wrong, I will admit, but <laughs> for the most part, I think we're about 90% accurate in dittoing down those surnames through the page so that everyone gets a surname, and now they're all uh, real people that can be searched. <laughs> That's terrific. Okay, after we get that extraction done, then we make normal records like you would see on Ancestry with uh, all the field names and the, the search forms that you're used to. So each one of these is a record. They're right? all now a new record. Okay. Right. And so this is just a little screenshot. We are, this is live and you, go, you can go use this today and we'll show this a little bit later. Um, but we have a search form that covers the whole United States. Every state, we, we have books for every state except the state of Alaska who 
guess it just really wasn't populated enough to generate very many city directories. <laughs> <didn't> do city directories. <laughs> um, let me talk a little bit about the date range. We've seen some as early as the early 1800s, okay. but I would say the, the, the kind of sweet spot of our collection is from about 1850 to about 1950. Wow. We have some as late as 1980, but what happened is as soon as phones became popular, the city directories those publishers switched over and started doing phone, phone listings. Books. Yeah. Okay. So we don't really have any phone listings in this. This is all pre-telephone. So these, the intention of the original city directories was residential and occupational. I need to find where someone lives. Okay. Um, and they were very uh, adamant about making sure everyone had one. The advertising on these things was uh, very... You, at the front of the book, it'll often say, here's why you need to buy this book. <laughs> and they were really quite expensive. But I think most people felt like they needed to know... Uh, especially business persons, need to know where everybody lived and be able to look them up either alphabetically or by street. Okay. Okay, so some things to come. We've, we've got a, a label on the, on the database on our website that says beta. What that basically means is we're still working on this. The, uh, the collection is complete. We're not going to be releasing any more new states right now. What we're going to do is go back and improve what we have. So there were a few cities that didn't work. They had some problems. We're going to add those cities in. We're going to add some more images that also had some issues with the OCR that we're going to clean up. The indexing is going to improve. Um, one of the things that we know we can do better on is we have a, some people, well, we have records that aren't people. Let's put it that way. So we, for example, you may have an advertisement on the top of the page that talks about house painting and how often my house painting business is. And so now house painting is a name. Is a name. Yeah. <laughs> so we've done some cleanup on that, but there's a lot more to come. Okay. Um, so those will get better. And that will increase uh, and improve the number of people available uh, to search okay. in the collection. Great. Well, let's take a look at this um, on the actual database here on Ancestry.com. So here is the database. Uh, the easiest way to find it, for those of you who are listening, is um, the card catalog. You know that that's one of my favorite places to go. And you can search then or filter then by directories, and it'll be one of the top things that comes up on that page. When you get to this, you're going to see that it's just like any of our search forms. Um, I always recommend that you scroll down and read the database description so that you understand some of the things that Laren has described today um, are actually listed here in this database description, like why beta is in the title and what you're going to use city directories for and what's in them. So you don't have to remember everything he's just shared with us. We've tried to include some of that information there. And then you're just going to search it just like you would any other database. So Laren, who is it that you wanted us to look for first here? I want to look for Arnold Elmo Castleberry. Um, this is someone who I was doing some research on this week. And, and where was he living? He was in Utah. Okay. I was quite surprised because we just released Utah. How many times uh, he did show up? Wow. Well, so it's an unusual name, so I think most of these are him. I do know from my uh, contact with the person I'm researching for that his wife's name is Zina, so I look over there and see in the spouse column quite a few instances where his wife is listed, which is a great way to filter down, is this my guy? Right. And I just want to point out here, because some people um, get a little bit confused about this, the residence year is actually listed right here in this index view um, of this records result page. And so you can see that even though he shows up several times here, that these are all for different years. Many times the, uh, the directory publishers would want to get a copy made every year. Okay. Uh, we don't have every year for every city <laughs> in the whole country, obviously, but... Um, in some cities, we have really good coverage, as you see here. Okay, and so you can kind of follow them year by year as they move, or as, in this case, they stay in the very same spot. So let's take a look at one of these records. I'm going to open it up in another tab here so we don't lose that. Here's the record page. Is there anything interesting yeah, here? Yeah, well, it, this is one of the things where you, you actually do want to look at all those entries and see what you see, because I happen to know that in this particular case, he's listed as an engineer, ENG, as okay. his occupation, but other places, he's working for the Coca-Cola bottling company, he works as an attendant in a, in a state mental hospital, he does all <laughs> kinds of interesting um, career changes throughout his life. Okay. Also, the street address will change as he moves. Um, so he stays in Provo. Stays but... in the same city, but okay. he moves around quite a bit. Okay, good. Let's take a look at this original image here. Um, see if we can find him on this page. He's a Castleberry, so he's probably going to be over here on the right-hand side of the page. And there he is right there, Elmo A, and his wife's name is listed. So we find from this he's an engineer. We also learn a little bit more. He works for, in the Ironton plant, whatever that is. The name of the company probably, yeah. The H stands for that he owns his home, and that's his address, so 956 West 500 South. Something else I'd like to point out is, uh, again, with Castleberry being an unusual name, but... 
Don, the line just above him, mm -hmm. is his brother, okay. and they show up almost always together. So they must have chosen to live pretty close to each other, <laughs> at least in the same town. Right. Um, and tells you a little bit about the family now that we see. We've got four people out of this one search. Okay. And then you mentioned earlier about um, comments. Let me see if I can get that window to pop open. Some of you may have seen this before. When you're viewing an image, there is an index uh, listed at the bottom of the page. Now, you may not be aware that you can open and close that. I don't know if you can see this on your screens. It's very faint. There's just a little bit of a gray arrow here. You just click it once and that will pop that window up or down. And so, Larry, when you were talking about these corrections that can be made to some of these records, how does that work? Yeah, so any one of these elements that you see there, the name or the year, you can click on those. Oh, well, not the year. The name <laughs> or the street address. You can click on those and make a correction. Now, in this case, amazingly, our extraction was pretty accurate and everything looks pretty good. But, for example, like here, his, his occupation is abbreviated. We could actually come in there and we could type that out. You could. You could. So yes. that people could search that way if they wanted to. Um, one thing you'll see, this is where you kind of ex we expose it a little bit. We're kind of brave here. We expose <laughs> that some of our uh, indexing may not be exactly perfect. So if you were to scroll up or down on this particular index, I guarantee you'll probably see some people at the top or the bottom really aren't names. That are advertised, the advertisements. Yeah. And those got. are the things that we're still working on as you see those. There we go. There's there, one right there. There's one right there. It's North not a University room. Avenue telephone. Uh, fixtures, lighting, contracting, electrical. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So those are the ones that we're still working on. Don't worry about those. We'll get rid of them. They'll get out of your way. Okay. Um, and, and it'll be a, a much cleaner database soon. Okay. That's great. Now there's a few other things that sometimes show up on these city directories. Um, you had mentioned that H was um, that they had a home. Sometimes we see an R listed. Um, or res listed before? Is there a little difference there? Each of the publishers had their own kind of abbreviation. So uh, it's it, the best thing to do is to, to go to the front of the book. And I want to do a quick uh, show how to do the browsing. But you, could, you can go to the front of the book and see what they said these, these abbreviations mean. In this case, res is resides. And so that's it's a little unclear whether he rents or owns in this particular book. But that's where he resides. BDS, which you see on the page there, is boards. So that would probably be a renter. Or a lodger. Okay. Um, you also see on here in parentheses, widow Anton, right there by the cursor. What that is is Anna is the wife. Her husband's name is Anton, and she is a widow, which is really helpful in in figuring out if it's <laughs> the right person. And we actually extract that and create the family okay. and give her the surname that or the him the surname that it was supposed to have. That's great. And so for a researcher, if I look up here, we're looking right now at a 1922 city directory in Michigan. Um, maybe we could go back to 1921 or 1920, see if Anton shows up, and now we have a window of time less than maybe the 10-year censuses yes. that we often have to figure out when Anton died. That's it, exactly. Okay. Um, one other thing while we're, we're on this page, you see a lot of street addresses. I highly recommend, it's quite interesting, to take that street address and go have a look and see if you can figure out where the house is. Yeah. Maybe even see a picture of that. Yeah, some of these homes are still standing. I use Google Maps quite often to use that street view, and sometimes those homes are still standing. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. cool. Okay, um, you do have the option up here uh, to save these records. There's this giant orange save button. It'll actually attach not just the record that Laren's been talking about, creating the little family and plugging that information directly into your tree, but it will actually, actually save a copy of this image as well. And like he mentioned, um, oftentimes, particularly in small towns, you may find that the people that are living next door or the people that are sorry listed next um, on the line might be siblings not maybe so much with Anders a page full of Andersons but mm -hmm. certainly with a page full of Castleberries you might find some relatives there now exactly. you mentioned something about browsing yes let's have a look at that one of the things we uh, did improve quite a bit off of the old version of the uh, city directories is the browser is a bit messy this is a very cleaned up browser you'll just see all the states listed so you can pick any state then you'll see any of the cities that we have an entry for in this case, quite a few for California. And each of those will be hopefully clean and not too messy. We're, we're, we've got a couple that we're still working on, but most of them are very nice. And then you pick the year that you want to see. So that gives you a sense of the coverage that we have in that particular town. Um, if you're having trouble with search and thinking, well, I, I know he's in there, Check the browse and make sure we have a, a book from that time period. Okay. Yeah, and for those of you who are working on the 1940 census, looking for your ancestors in those images, every time we talk about needing to know where they live, these city directories become invaluable for that, particularly those city directories that were created in the late 1930s, early 1940s, so you can figure out exactly the street address where your family member was living so that you can then go browse those 1940 census images before um, the index is completely searchable. Exactly. 
The other thing to note while browsing, not particularly in this case we're looking at, but there are often about 10 to 15 pages of just advertisements in front matter. Okay. Work your way through that. Sometimes you have to jump ahead a bit <laughs> into the collection to, to get to the actual alphabetical list. Okay, so you can scroll through image by image using these arrows here, or as he mentioned, you can just jump ahead, and I could just jump ahead, say, to page 15 by just typing that number in and hitting enter, and it jumps me immediately to the 15th image in that specific collection. Yep. Okay. Um, well, I think that that is about all we have time for today. This has been really informative for me. I've already used city directories. I've been with the company for not quite as long as Larry, um, but I learned something new today, and that's great. If you have questions um, about the city directory specifically, questions about the process that we're using, questions about how to use them a little bit better, please feel free to send those questions in to ask at Ancestry.com, be sure to include city directories in your subject line. I'll review those, and if we need to have a follow-up session with Laren in a few weeks, or um, if we need to maybe do a blog post to help put out some more information or answer some questions that may have been unclear, we're happy to do that. Um, we do have more events scheduled. We will do another behind the scenes with another one of our product managers um, next month. We also have our weekly live stream broadcasts. You can find out about those on our Facebook page at facebook.com ancestry.com. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Thank you, Lauren, for being here. Thanks for having me.